Hi and welcome to another episode of Delaware County Political News, Meet the Candidate. I am your host, Larry DeMarco, and today we are here with Thaddeus Kirkland, the mayor of Chester. Mayor Kirkland was a state representative from 1992 to 2016 for the 159th Legislative District of Pennsylvania. He decided not to run in 2016 when he elected to run for mayor and was elected the mayor of the city of Chester. He is also pastor of Community Baptist Church. Mr. Mayor, thank you for being a guest at Delaware County Political News. Larry, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening. Um, we've been trying to get together for, a t for some time. Our schedules have been uh, somewhat different, <laughs> but we're here today and I'm glad to be here to be able to talk about some of the issues. Especially glad to have you. Appreciate you making time, Mayor. Appreciate uh, uh, being here today. We really do. And uh, appreciate you sending out the offer to come. A lot of big things in the news, particularly and sadly, gun violence. You in Chester are at the front lines. What would you like to see the legislature in Pennsylvania and Congress do in reference to gun control? Gun violence has been an issue, uh, more so in communities, uh, poor communities or communities of color. Now it's, it's stretching out to, to other communities. Uh, what just happened uh, at the high school or the school with those young persons uh, was, was, tra was tragic. Um, but what it did was it began to open the eyes of everybody about gun violence. Uh, I had, the, I won't say pleasure, but I went to Columbine uh, many years ago when that tragedy happened with gun violence and students being killed. And I just saw the hurt and the pain and the cars that were covered by kids who had gone to school to get an education never to return out of the classroom because of the gun violence. And yes, we have our share of gun violence in my community that I call Chester. And what I'd like to see uh, are a number of things. Number one, young people don't wake up in the morning with guns in their hands. I mean, they're not born with guns in their hands. Somebody's, uh, somebody, somebody's bringing those weapons of war, that's what I call them, to our communities and placing them in the hands of young people. Number one, I would like to see a gun task force. There is a gun task force in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, but it has not spread to communities such as mine. And by having that gun task force, we begin the process of tracing those guns, finding out how those guns come into communities such as Chester. The other thing is I would like to see uh, Harrisburg do is provide legislation that would say the same as a person wanting to drive a car, the same as a person wanting to be married, same as a person that wants to go fishing. You have to have a license in order to purchase ammunition. Anybody can walk off the street right now go to any gun shop and say, give me a couple of shell, a couple of cases of shells and walk back right back out without question. If you're not licensed to carry the gun, why should a person be able to come into a store, to a gun store and purchase ammunition? If you, if you don't have the ammunition, you can't use the gun. The other thing is we want to talk, make sure that uh, background checks are done properly. Um, and the time is taken to do the background checks, checks, not some quick, fast, in a hurry type of event where persons can come in and you do a, a quick paper, quick piece of paperwork and it's over. But real background checks uh, that allow the persons that are doing the background checks to fully vet those individuals who are trying to get the gun, purchase the, the weapons. And last but definitely not least, the types of guns that are being sold. Um, people keep talking about the Second Amendment and wanting to uh, take away a person's second, the second Amendment rights. Nobody wants that. But I do think we have to revisit the Second Amendment and bring it up to date. Um, I don't think that our founding fathers wanted us to be having our possession AK-47s, machine guns, high-powered assault rifles on our streets uh, in the hands of, of not only uh, criminals, but in the hands of daily, everyday people. Um, those are not the type of weapons, those are weapons of war. 
It's plain, it's simple, they're weapons of war, and that's where they need to be on the battlefield, not in the communities. So when we start doing some things in Harrisburg like that, doing sensible legislation, I think that we can begin to turn that corner. Um, people have got to stop being so afraid of the NRA. I mean, and the NRA has got to begin to use some simple common sense. We're trying to save lives. We're not trying to take away anybody's rights. You actually anticipated my next question. Is the NRA the biggest hurdle? Because a lot of the solutions, there seems to be bipartisan support, but it seems like the NRA is leading the opposition to most of the reform that both parties seems to be behind. The NRA is leading the opposition, and unfortunately, unfortunately, the NRA has very long tentacles that reach on both sides of the aisle, uh, meaning Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and they have long dollars. Um, and if you accept those dollars, then you have, to, you have to actually pledge allegiance to the NRA. I've never accepted any dollars from the NRA. They, as a matter of fact, when I get their information, uh, asking me to respond to that questionnaire, I simply discard it because uh, I don't support their views and their ideals. Um, folks feel obligated and beholding to the NRA because they've taken their money, they fund their campaigns, and now by taking my money and funding the campaign, you have to do exactly what I say do. Um, and I believe that that ties your hands uh, when it comes to being a, an effective uh, legislator, an effective congressperson, an effective mayor, an effective elected official. And um, one of the things that I don't want to do is have my hands tied when it comes to uh, producing legislation that helps my district. Mr. Mayor, you're in a primary with, I believe it's 13 people. Do you notice a division between the candidates on the issue of gun violence between the candidates from Philadelphia and Chester versus the ones in the suburban part of the county? I don't see a division. I see a, a, a lack of understanding when it comes to gun violence or, or gun issues when it comes to Chester versus uh, other communities and other, other areas of the county. Why? It's almost exactly the same as the uh, opioid addiction. Um, years ago, many years ago, there was a crack cocaine addiction in cities like mine, cities of Chester. Um, and during that time, it was basically uh, lock them up. Um, you know, those persons are addicted to crack cocaine and they're not worth the time of day. They're useless. Their lives are, aren't worth much. And now you have this opioid crisis that has spread throughout and it's going into the more affluent and wealthier communities. And now the thing is, what persons have to do is there is this uh, Narcan solution that brings them back if they overdose. They're talking about uh, shoot, shoot sites where they can go, uh, safe sites where they can go to use the drug. Um, and they're talking about education and versus incarceration. One of the things I think that they should have been doing with when it comes to any drug or any alcohol problem is always talk about education versus incarceration. And education versus incarceration and rehabilitation. Helping the individual get their life or their lives back on track. Nobody wants to be a drug addict. Nobody wants to be addicted to anything. They fall into that trap persons have fallen into that trap in the past and they're going to continue to fall into that trap in the future. Our job as elected officials is to find a way to help them overcome that hurdle or help them get out of that trap and not just get out of the trap, stay out of the trap and lead a productive and healthy life. Let's talk about criminal justice reform and our district attorney in Philadelphia. How, what reform would you like to see across the state? The number one thing I think that has to happen is, again, I'm a big uh, proponent of education. 
most crimes are committed by persons who, uh, whose educational level is very low. Their reading level is very low. Their math level is very low. Their self-esteem is very low. Um, and so when we, we talk about criminal justice reform and correcting the lives of persons who have done some wrong in their lives, uh, it, we cannot simply say, let's lock them up, lock them up, three strikes, you're out, um, let's, throw, let's throw away the key. But we have to find a way to turn people's lives around. Every crime is not a crime that leads to incarceration. There are times, there are opportunities for us to take when persons do commit minor crimes where we can get them to find their wealth and their, and, and, and their worth in working in, in senior facilities, working with other uh, seniors, talking to seniors. Matter of fact, a senior is probably the best person to be able to share with that person that has committed a crime about how you can turn their lives around. Because seniors have been through something in their lives. We cannot, we cannot arrest, arrest, arrest. We have to reform, reform, reform. And I think when we get on that track and on that, that trail, then we can, we can have a better grip, a better handle on the persons that we're trying to um, um, help us turn our entire communities around. When these persons do, when they find themselves incarcerated, and they come out, we need to utilize them in a better way. Has our country been too punitive in terms of how we respond to uh, arrests and crimes versus rehabilitation? I think so. I, I, I think that we have focused on the dollar. Look, we're building more prisons. Our, our prison, prison populations are growing. Our college and universities populations are going down. It is our, our priorities are messed up. And so we're folk and, and when you focus on the dollar, you realize that, I mean, some communities, uh, their, their livelihood is based on the number of prisons that are in their, in their community. And uh, the number of jobs that are gained by those persons in that community, who live in that community, who are now working uh, as prison personnel. Um, I think that we have, um, we missed the mark. We missed the mark, and we we still have an opportunity to, to turn things around. Um, many of those persons, even that are, are incarcerated, if there's not a very good and productive reentry program, so that folks can come back to come back into and work through that reentry program to become productive in their society, then they just simply go back into the prison system. And once again. It's supposed to be called. It's supposed to be called a correctional facility, which means you correct the behavior. If they're going, if it's a revolving door, then who's that? Who's failing? The person that's being incarcerated, or the facility itself? At the forum, at the candidate forum, you made a comment in reference to the educational system in Chester that the state let down the people of Chester. How do you mean? Well, it did in a number of reasons, a number of ways. We have, um, I remember when, when being in Harrisburg and we did the charter school legislation. We put the charter school legislation in place and charter schools were supposed to be the helpmates of our public schools. They're supposed to be competition for our public schools, which is great. And they're supposed to be different from our public schools. That was the hope, that was the dream, that was uh, the commitment. Did it work out that way? It did not. It did not. Some charter schools, I must say, some, some charter schools are different. Some charter schools have come at education in a different way. Others have not. And they've been very profitable and it, is, it has hurt the public school system. It has hurt the community. And the state... How? This, well, How has it hurt the system it is, and it, the community? Number one, it has taken students from the public schools and placed them in the charter schools. And granted, parents parents want their children to be, go to be able to go to a safe place when it comes to education. Um, the other, so, and the other thing we had heard is financial. Instead of the state setting aside monies 
a financial stream to, that goes directly to the charter schools, they were being reimbursed or taking money from the public school system to place within the charter school system. And that hurt every school financially. There should have been two separate pools of money. The state should have come up with a way of making sure that the money from the public school wasn't being siphoned and going to the charter schools. Because when you do that, then programs are cut. And when programs are cut, that means that the young people are now um, missing out on many, many other activities or courses, classes that other schools have. For example, uh, one of the greatest uh, portions or parts of the Chester Upland School District, in my mind, was the um, vocational training school. Uh, everybody's not going to college. I, I, and we would like for that, but everybody's not going to college. Increasingly and, more, that's seeming right. to be a better choice not to because of debt. And debt is one of them, but the other thing is you look around us, we need, we're going to need electricians, we're going to need uh, uh, carpenters, we're going to need uh, bricklayers, we're going to need all of that. And to have young people, and they can still go to college, they can still get a college degree, but we're going to need persons who are, who are skilled in the various trades and labors. And, um, to take away a vocational training school, like the one we had in Chester, uh, and place it someplace uh, more fluent, uh, simply a, a travesty and it's wrong. Um, our young people could benefit greatly by having a uh, vocational school right here in our community. And you're saying it's the charter schools that dried up that funding? No, the charter schools didn't drive, up, drive that funding. The uh, Department of Education dried up that funding. Mr. Mayor, before we started today, you were discussing certain factors that set up a state receiver for failure even before he came in. Can you flush that out a little bit? Sure, sure. Our, 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 our school system, I believe, was set up for failure. And uh, it continues to be set up for failure because the Department of Education has not taken the necessary steps to make sure that we receive the proper funding, that we receive the proper leadership, uh, and that we receive the proper uh, uh, facilities and equipment needed to move forward. Um, we've had a number of superintendents, far too many superintendents that were appointed to our school district, um, which means there's no stability at the top. And when there's no stability at the top, then the, the rest of the house of cards begin to fall. Uh, we have a superintendent that has been uh, in place now, Dr. Juan Bond, who had been uh, with the school district in past times. But I, I believe he's been just simply dealt a terrible hand to have to have to work with. And uh, that, that's, that's the state's fault. That's not the community's fault. That's not uh, his fault. Was set up that, what was the hand that he was dealt? The hand that he was dealt was, was this. Um, there, were, there were records that are, have not been kept from past administrations. Um, the state has not been like on on the past administration like it should have been. We had a receiver in place that the state put in place that has had not been effective in holding the uh, past administration feet to the fire. They're more concerned about you know their income than their output when it comes to educating our kids. Uh, and those, those things, things hurt. hurt. Our, our teachers have to dig in their pockets for uh, whatever type of equipment and uh, things that they need in order to educate our kids. When in other school districts, um, they have the financial wherewithal and need, uh, to meet the needs of the educators in meeting the needs of our children. Um, these are all things that set you up for failure. And the state knowing, I believe, knowingly allow this to happen and never stepped up to the plate. You also said in part that the, the receiver or whatever leadership was in place was not a member of the community and did not know the needs of the community. Exactly. And, you know, they keep bringing in receivers and we, we tried to, even when we make suggestions, we, the community, 
um, the state overlooked our suggestions and went to what they believe will be better for the city of Chester. These persons um, may have been good in their own mind, in their own heart, but they did not know the community. They did not know the needs of the young people. Um, they don't know, they did not really know that some of these young people come to school with severe issues and uh, go home with those same severe issues. They don't know what the, what the household is going through and neither do they take the time to find out, to spend the time in these communities talking to these young people, talking to these parents. Um, they don't do it because uh, I guess that's not part of their, um, um, that's not part of what it is required of them by the state. Mr. Mayor, to change topics a little bit now, you're also a congressional candidate and you believe that we're not doing everything that we can for our veterans. What do you want to see done that's not being done? You know, Larry, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that question as well because our veterans are basically the backbone of this country. They are the ones who um, kiss their families uh, goodbye at times uh, to go across, to go to faraway lands and protect us, protect us. And they do so willingly and they do so because they love this country. But when they come back, some of them, many of them come back uh, broken, shattered, uh, emotionally, physically, spiritually, uh, and financially. And we have basically, uh, time and time again, we talk about how important it is to take care of our veterans. And they come back and they end up homeless, but we have time and time again talked about how important it is to take care of our veterans. And that's all they've done is talk. Time for talk is over. As someone who would represent the 5th Congressional District, number one, I would say that when it comes to our veterans, we need to have in place and, and in writing in place that when our veterans come home, not just, we won't just talk about uh, hiring a vet, and, you know, putting it on paper, hiring a vet, talk about it. No, no, no. First things first. If our veterans come home and need employment. I don't care if they're physically uh, damaged because of the ravages of war. We have to find something for them to do and receive a livable wage. That means employment. We also have to take care of them physically. Our veterans shouldn't have to travel miles and miles and miles away to various veterans hospitals only to get there to find out that they've missed an appointment, they're too late for an appointment, or they get there and the appointment lasts five to ten minutes. That's unacceptable. There needs to be more veteran facilities throughout the Commonwealth, throughout the country, quite frankly, but throughout the Commonwealth to make sure that our veterans are taken care of properly and immediately. They should not have to wait. When the call came for them to go to war, they didn't wait, they didn't hesitate. They were there. And we need to make sure that we're there to help make them whole immediately. Not going through all this bureaucracy and paperwork and all those other things that discourage them from even going to the facility. We also have to be mindful of their families. Their families are given a lot. And so when you're putting, when you're making a veteran whole again, then there has to be a family piece that goes in there because this veteran is coming back to a family that is also broken, that is also shattered and torn. So there has to be some type of help that goes a long way in helping this veteran uh, um, re-engage re with his family, his or her family. Um, help them um, work through the issues with their families and uh, not just not just there for the short run but there for the long run our veterans have uh, given their all i'm not a veteran my i have three brothers uh, that are veterans and um, fortunately none of them ever had to go to war but i can only imagine what a family goes through when a family member comes back home and, and has given their all and uh, the country simply 
turns their back on them at times. There shouldn't, there shouldn't be a thing as a homeless vet in America. There should not be anything such as a homeless vet. And we have too many. And too many, far too many. Mr. Mayor, you were elected in 2016 to mayor, and now you want to run for Congress. Why do you want to run? And that's an excellent question, Larry. And some folks have asked me that already uh, back home. And one of the thoughts was, is he abandoning his community? And the answer to that is no. I want to run because it's, a, it's an opportunity to bring more resources back to communities just like Chester. And there are many of them throughout Delaware County. Um, it's an opportunity to bring real educational funding back to communities just like Chester and throughout Delaware County and the 5th Congressional District. It's an opportunity to bring back real dollars that will allow you to build and rebuild the infrastructure in communities such as Chester and communities throughout Delaware County and the 5th Congressional District. And when you are bringing back uh, federal dollars to rebuild the infrastructure, what you're doing is you're creating jobs within the community. And when you create jobs, you cut down on crime. That's why I want to go. I want to go because I want to be able to get my hand on those resources to bring them, to bring them back home so that we can rebuild the walls within our very own communities. And I think as a congressman, as a, as a mayor, um, uh, we get things done, we're on the front lines, and we do a lot, working with our council, an awful lot. But I think as a congressman, we can do more and we can do better. And that's what I want to be able to do, do more and do better for the people of the 5th Congressional District. You're running in a primary with 12 other candidates. Why should people vote for you? Well, and all those candidates are great people. I, I have the pleasure of meeting some of them for the very first time. Um, and they're all um, knowledgeable, educated, great people um, whom I think would be great congresspersons to serve in the, in the 5th Congressional District. But why do I think that I should be uh, chosen over all of them? And it's very simple. Number one, I've served in the legislature for 24 years serves as a state representative. And if you're gonna step into the halls of Congress, you can't step in there cold. My belief is you see the chaos, you see the confusion, you see what the president is doing or not doing. And you see some fear on behalf of Congress persons on both sides. You have to be ready to step into that role day one with, the, with an agenda of the people and with a heart and the skill set to get things done and work on both sides of the aisle. 24 years has given me that. And uh, I, know, I know by serving for 24 years and working with persons on both sides of the aisle, working in leadership, getting highways in my district, getting uh, recreational facilities built in my district, getting bridges built in my district, I had to work both sides of the aisle and know how to navigate those political waters. We were able to do that, um, and something that we're very proud of. The other thing is, I've had the pleasure of chairing committees. I chaired the Tourism and Recreation Committee. Um, I, if, if my history serves me correctly, I think I'm the first person from Delaware County to ever chair the Tourism and Recreation Committee in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And if you know anything about tourism and recreation, it's the second leading industry in the, in the Commonwealth. Uh, I was chair of that, and I was proud of that. And, um, and after that, a casino was built, a stadium was built <laughs> <laughs> in Chester. Yeah, we, 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 no yeah, coincidence no, no there. No but, <laughs> but we were proud of those things. And uh, I was also chairman of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, and I was the first person outside of Philadelphia to ever chair the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus. And so these leadership skills and, and, and um, many persons talk about uh, different things that they would do 
I've done, I've proposed gun legislation. I've, I, I, I've stood on the House floor and debated with other colleagues on the House floor. I've stood on the House floor and fought for educational reform. I've stood on the House floor and fought for, uh, against gun violence. I've been on the House floor, I've gone to leadership, I've spoken and debated and had conversations with the Speaker of the House. And I've had conversations with numerous governors down through my 24 years to help bring about change within the 159th Legislative District of which I was a state representative. So I know how. I don't have, I don't, there's not a learning curve. I don't have to wait till somebody pushes the button uh, to say, okay, now, now you can get started. Or I don't have to wait, and uh, as most freshmen would have to do when they get to uh, Congress, uh, to try to feel their way through. Um, we already have relationships. Uh, we already have the skill set. We have the tenacity. We have the, the, uh, the mindset and the will to do the will of the people. Now we just need a majority in Congress. Well, if, if we're elected as the 5th Congressional District, we're one person close, closer to that majority. Mr. Mayor, we'll leave it there. And I want to thank you for being a guest. Larry, thank you. And, and, and may, let me tell, say this to you. Uh, it won't be this long next time. <laughs> I would love to have you as another guest. Thank you so much. Thank you, Larry. We have been here with Mayor Kirkland, and I am your host, Larry DeMarco. If you like this video, please share it with all the members of your contact list and Facebook friends. We are signing off. Tune in next time. Bye for now.